Good evening, good evening, and welcome to New Restoration Outreach Christian Center Bible Study tonight. We have a good word tonight. I pray that all is well. Um, going with you earlier today and, and moving around, and at this time, let us spend some time with God. Uh, let us continue to pray again for our nation, and I know it's coming up on Memorial Weekend, so we're all prepared to get out the house and uh, things are opening back up, and I pray that all is well as you go about your plans this evening. Family, family, welcome. Again, giving a shout out to uh, Bishop Ellis in our home church down in New Restoration Outreach Christian Center, Raleigh, North Carolina. Giving a shout out to uh, Master's Touch and, and New Restoration West Palm Beach. God bless each and every one of you. Family, God bless you. Give me a virtual hug online. I love each and I miss you. I miss you. And things are about to about to open back up, but we got to use a little wisdom. My family back in Pittsburgh and my family in Philly and all my cousins and all those that, that are friends, God bless you and welcome tonight. Please join me in prayer right now. Father, we thank you, Lord, for another night, Father God. We thank you for another day, O oh Lord. Father, we know that some of us had a really busy day. Some of us had some anxiety today. Some of us are dealing with certain situations in our life today, Father God. But, Lord, we're going to put all that right now on the altar right now, Father God. We ask that you remove all the weights and anxieties and fears, everything that is holding us down, Lord, so that we can focus on you and the word of God tonight, this relevant word tonight, Father God. Father, we ask, Lord, that we open our hearts, Lord, to what thus saith the Lord, allow the Holy Spirit to move in our life, Father God. Lord, give us that manna, that rhema word, Lord, so that we can go forth, Lord, in the purpose that you have in our lives, Lord, that we can step out in faith, Father God, that we can step out in the deliverance that you have, that you can step out, Father God, and pray for somebody, Lord, in our lives, Lord, and just, Lord, continue, Lord, to do a marvelous work, Lord. As we get into your word tonight, Father God, we give it over to you, Holy Spirit. We give you our undivided attention. Now, Lord, use your manservant tonight, Father God, to teach the word of God, Lord. We are careful to give you all the honor, Lord. And, Lord, we continue to pray for our first responders, Lord, those that are on the front line, Lord. Those, Father God, are continually, Lord, to face and to heal and to see miracles happening, Father God. We pray for them right now, Lord. Strengthen them, Lord. Strengthen them at this very hour, Lord. And, Lord, let your work, your marvelous work, continue to work, Father God. We give you the glory. We give you the honor, Lord, and we give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So thank God for you tonight. Again, family, give you a virtual hug. I have a great word tonight. The, the sermon title tonight is Don't Go Down to Egypt. Have you ever had a time in your life where you made a, 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 a life-changing decision, you got excited about uh, an opportunity, uh, whether it's a job or a relationship, something in your life, you, you put it forth and you moved on it and you told your family about this excited change in your life, you saw it lined up perfectly, it was a promotion, uh, things, you had a house planned out, you even changed your address with the post office, you were set forth and moving out, you had your bags packed, you had the moving truck loaded up, but then you decided to spend some time with the Lord. You decided to, to pray, and God said, no, I'm not in that. Do not go. Well, this happened to Isaac from the Bible, and in the Bible, God gave him a word that said, do not go down in Egypt. And, and this time that, that you... But God uh, spoke to you, it, it, it hurt your pride in a sense because you had already went out and made the plans. You had already decided. And you already said that God's in it. But God gave you a word. God brought that hammer down on you and said, no, I'm not in it. So then you are faced with a challenge. You're faced with a decision to whether I go forth in the plans that I have on my own or whether I just adhere to God's word and trust God. 
That's a hard decision, and many of us have made many times in our lives, and, and many of us maybe made the wrong decision at times when it comes to maybe a relationship or something that is a life changer. And we, we believe that we have put it, we believe that God was in it, but we found out that God wasn't. How do you deal with that situation? Well, please turn into your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 25. We'll start off at verse Five, and we're going to talk about Isaac, and we're going to talk about the decision that he had to make and how God had blessed him with favor. So verse 5 reads, it says, And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. At this time, Abraham is old, and Abraham blessed Isaac with everything that he had. So here we see Isaac the son of Abraham. And it's interesting to know that really there's not a lot to talk about Isaac. There's a lot that we know about Abraham. It's about 14 chapters of Genesis that talk specifically about the life of Abraham and how he moved out and how God favored him all the way into where he was going to sacrifice Isaac. And many of us in Sunday school understand that Isaac was the one that, that, that Abraham set out and he was about to kill him and then there was a ram in the bush. So right now we see that in this chapter, in verse 25, Isaac inherits the riches and the possessions of Abraham. We know that Abraham had a lot of stuff. He was rich. And then we see in verse 6, he says, but unto his sons. Now, let me, let me set the content. Abraham got remarried. He had some concubines. He had some other children, even besides Ishmael. But we see, again, that in verse 5, it says, Abraham gave all unto Isaac. But unto his sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts. But then Abraham sent them away from Isaac. You see, you got to understand the covenant was going to flow and is going to flow through the purpose and promised child. And that is Isaac. And so we see that it says, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. So now we see that. Isaac is being established at the continuity of what God has promised Abraham. God has promised that, that, that Abraham will be a father of many nations. God, he's a father of faith. He shall be blessed. And you can, the stars can't even number the, those that are coming from Isaac, uh, Abraham. So in verse 7, it says, In these days, the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, was 103 score and 15 Abraham lived to be 175 years old. Now we see that the legacy of Abraham's covenant flows through Isaac. Isaac knows all the stories of God. We have to understand that though Moses wrote the book, the five first five books of the Bible, the Torah, those stories had to come through. So here we see that Isaac understands where we came from, the Adam and Eve story, the Noah story. Isaac got all this passed down knowledge from Abraham. And so he's told about even he probably remembers the time when he was sacrificed or was about to be killed. But God said no. So all of this is on Isaac now, the covenant, the stories, the everything is on Isaac. And so he must continue to carry the covenant of God. But now we go to verse uh, chapter 26, verse 1. And so we see here, verse 1, I'll give you a minute, of chapter 26, verse 1. We see that the Bible says that, and there was a famine in the land. Interesting. Let's talk about this for a minute. And there was a famine. So, so a famine in what land? Well, this is the land that Isaac, and it was promised through the covenant by God. And so now we see that there's a the famine and besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham, if you recall in your Bibles that in Genesis chapter 12, there was also a famine. And then Abraham had actually moved and went down into the land of Egypt. And we know that he told a couple of lies about his wife, Sarah, at that time. So it's interesting that there's another famine, but not like the, the, the times of Abraham. So Isaac went to Abimelech, which is the king of the Philistines, the Philistines unto Gerera. 
And so here we see that the famine represents the lack of abundance or provision in the land. Now, let me get, up, get you straight. This is the promised land. This is the land that was promised by the covenant, but see, we see that there's a famine. We also know that a famine was serving as a test to Isaac's life. We also know that true faith is always tested, either by temptation within us or by trials around us. Again, let me say that. True faith is always tested, either by temptation through us, through our own lust. The Bible says our desires and lust, or through the trials that are within us. In other words, the environment, the things that we cannot control. And it's since Isaac knows that there's a famine in the land. And so he remembers one thing about a famine that what his father's done. His father left the land. And so Isaac decides to pack up. Isaac decides to make that decision that we make in our lives just, just to move out. We know that there's nothing here anymore. We know that this job is at a dead end. We know that this relationship or even this marriage is not being fruitful anymore. It might be feeling like a famine. And so we decide to move out. We decide from our own understanding. And it makes sense because the grass looks greener on the other side. At this time, Isaac had made a decision in his life for his family and for himself to move out because of the famine, because of the situation that presents itself. It's not productive. It's not fertile. But remember, this is the land that God promised to Isaac. And so Isaac lives in this land. It is the promised land, but he makes a decision here. He makes a decision to, to leave. And so he talks to the king, Ab Abimelech. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Abimelech. Abimelech, because you'll see that same name in Genesis chapter 20, where Abraham talked to Abimelech. Well, you might ask in the Bible, and this is a, this is a Bible study, so we're going to break it down. I'll break it down for you. You said, well, how is it possible that Abraham talked to Abimelech years ago, and now we see Isaac talking to Abimelech? Well, it's simple. Abimelech is not a name of a person. Abimelech is the title of that person. In other words, the king of Philistine is Abimelech. And so when you see the name Abimelech uh, in Genesis chapter 20, you also see the name Abim Abimelech with Isaac as well. They're not the same person, but he's talking to the king of the Philistines. And he's letting the king of Philistines know, simple, just like the post office, he's saying that I'm going to change my address. I am taking my family because you got to understand, Isaac had a lot of money. Isaac had a lot of wealth. But here he makes a decision, says, I'm going to take my family, and we're going to simply move and go down to Egypt, which is the land of fertile, fertilization. Egypt is fertile. Egypt's got it going on. Egypt's got everything. And I'm going to take all my money from you, King Philistine, Amalek, and I'm going to move down to Egypt. It's because why? Because there's a famine in the land. And so we see, just like we do every day, we make decisions based off of our circumstances of what's around us. And so even in life, we see that a famine can represent the place of our marriage, and our marriage is not where it should be. Our marriage is in a famine. But it doesn't mean that you go down to Egypt. Or let me say that again. Just because your marriage is in a famine does not mean that you go down to Egypt. Well, let me make that plain to you. Just because you're in trouble in your marriage don't mean you go out and step out on your wife or your husband. So we see here, because that's a covenant, and I want you to understand that. Your marriage is a covenant. God gave Abraham the land, it's a promised land, it's a covenant. Now, let me understand, let me break something down about promised land. When God says, I will give you from a promise this land, which is a covenant, God never says that I'm going to give you this land that is perfect. Okay, let me break that down again. Just because God promised you a job or promised you a house doesn't mean that that job is going to be hunky-dory every day. Doesn't mean that you're going to just have the greatest time at work 
eight hours, five days a week, and everybody's going to love you. But God did promise you that job. You got the job, but doesn't mean that you're not going to have some famines or times in your life or times on that job where it's just you don't want to go in. But it also doesn't mean that just because you have circumstances on your job, just because you have circumstances in your marriage, just because you have circumstances that your house is falling apart, doesn't mean that you just give up and go or quit. Because what God promised you is, is for you. But now we see that Isaac is making a decision, a life-changing decision, that affects the covenant of God that's upon his life because he's decided he wants to go down to Egypt. Again, just like the children of Israel, when they went into the promised land, they saw giants. Well, God said this is the promised land, but it doesn't mean that you don't have to fight for it or, or there's other people there. So we have to stop trying to make what God gives us or the promises of God make it perfect. It's not perfect. It's not heaven. We're not heaven or earth. God promised you something, and he's going to give it. He's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a God of his word. But does it mean that it's going to be perfect or you're not going to have bad or good days? So Isaac remembers the stories of his father, Abraham. Isaac remembers the fact that Abraham, when there was a famine in the land, he went down into Egypt. So from Isaac's mindset, because he's inherited all these stories, he feels that that's the, and God blessed Abraham. So why don't I just do the same thing? Just like we do in life, we take the experiences of our fathers and mothers or big mama's testimony, and we it's good to learn and, and to hear the testimony, but you also got to make sure that you talk to God to see if that is relevant for what God has for you because what God has done for somebody else doesn't necessarily equate to you. It might build your faith, but you still have to hear from God. Because it's, it's a right time where it's a relevant time. And that might have been past 40, 50 years ago. And so we see that Abraham, Isaac went to Abimelech, the king of Philistine. And he began to march his family, his moving trucks. Everybody was moving south. He was on the east side, just like the Jeffersons. But he's moving south now, coming down here to Virginia. Because there's a famine in the land. But everything seems to be okay. But, I mean, that's, it's a good decision, right? Why? Why? Well, you know, I, it's the right decision. My father made that decision. It's the right decision to take that job. The job's a promotion. The job had, they given me a car. They're giving me all these, these good incentives and plans and everything. Everything looks good. But we have to understand about something about God. Just because it looks good, God knows the future. God has a purpose for us. So when we are considering ourselves, as Paul said, a bond servant of Christ, if we are considering ourselves fully sold out to God, then we need to fully what? Rely on God. And so we see that in verse 2, Genesis 26 and verse 2, it says here, it says that, and the Lord appeared unto him, him being Isaac. And he says, Go not down unto Egypt. He said, don't go down there. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Mm. He's telling Isaac now, I looked in the Bible, and, and, and you know, Isaac is, is kind, of, kind of not really talked about. He's in the middle. He's from Abraham, has all these chapters about him. Then you have Isaac. Then you have a lot about Jacob or, you know, soon to be called Israel and the 12 tribes. But Isaac. And so if you look in your word of God, it says, well, when did God ever talk to Isaac? And so we don't know. This is the first and only time that I could find in the Bible that I know of that God spoke to Isaac, the son of Abraham. And so God gives him a word and God says, go not down to Egypt. I mean, he's on his way. He made some plans. He's already talked to the king of the Philistines. Hey, I'm moving out of your way. I'm going to bless you. Here you go. We're leaving. My family, my band, you can have my well. You can have my land. All that is yours. Or well, I've rented it out to you. But I'm going down here because of this famine. Because this provision is not here anymore. But see, we see that God has another plan for him. 
And so God tells them, do not go down into Egypt. Many times in our life, we will have plans. And, and, and then you think about it, you say, well, well, God, you knew that I'd already started planning. You knew that I already changed my address at the post office. You knew that I'd already accepted this job. Why are you giving me a word now? Why are you giving me a word after all these decisions I made? Why didn't you talk to me to prevent me from making these decisions? Well, one thing we got to know and understand about God is God wants us to trust him. And so God allows us to go a certain way. The Bible says that we, 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 we plan in a man's heart. He devises a plan, but the Lord directs it. We could say that maybe at times you got so excited about your job, you got so excited about this new relationship that you found on social media, on Facebook, friend. You got so excited that you really wasn't hearing from anybody or even God. You got so excited because it looked so good. It, it was promising. It was a promotion and everything. You, you're now the chief executive of the highest major whatever job. You weren't hearing, you didn't spend time with God because you were already so excited. God could not get to you because you were on your natural high. You just knew you were convinced in your heart, your mind that this is of God. Why? Because it's just, it's just a blessing. It just worked. Everything worked out the way it was supposed to. But then you find out it's not. And now Isaac is, is faced with that same situation because God tells him, do not go down into Egypt. And so here we see that, that now he has to make a decision. And again, the Bible says that in Proverbs 16 and 9, it says, a man's heart devises his ways. We can make plans all day. But the Lord directs our steps. And so Isaac has to make a decision here. He has to make a, 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 a life-changing decision. But see, something else that Isaac doesn't understand, he really doesn't understand the covenant that's really upon his life. Because he's never talked to God from we understand. We, he's never really talked to God. But here, he, his, his, his mind was so made up to leave the land, even though it's a famine and it makes logical sense why would you be in a land that's dry? Why would you be in a job that's not being able to be provided? Well, God wants you to trust him because there's a covenant upon that situation. And so Isaac has to make a decision here. He has to decide in his life, do he continue to walk down to Egypt where he knows the land is prosperous? He has many uh, uh, goods. He, he's blessed beyond measure because he inherited all of Abraham's goods. Or do he stay in his dry, barren land with these Philistines that he's not sure what the life, what, what's going to be? So he has to, in a sense, trust God. This is a hard decision, and many of us have to make these hard decisions. But one thing for sure, if we have the faith if we have the faith, we need to sit down and trust God through it all. Though it does not look like it's going to be prosperous, though it looks like it's going to be a step back, though it looks like you're going to get ridiculed, though you might even have to uh, swallow your pride. Because now people are going to question you, wait a minute, wait a minute. Two days ago, you were all excited about this thing. Now you're changing your mind. What's going on here? What's changed? Well, what's changed is you didn't get a word from God. But God is not here to, to punish you. God is trying to prevent you from doing something that would even harm you. And then you got to understand your blessings flow through the Lord. So in all your excitement, you didn't ask God. Again, Isaac was walking and, and, and acting upon what he knew of his father. He knew things of his father. He knew that his father made decisions that God blessed him going to Egypt. So why would God not bless me? God bless my father or, or whatever to take this job. Why won't God bless me? Why won't God bless me? Well, it's what's for you is for you. That's why we got to have a personal relationship with God. So the Bible also says, in thy ways, acknowledge him in all our ways. 
Isaac did not seek God at the time. Isaac just went off of what he knew of his father, what he knew of the circumstances his father laid up on, because he knew all the stories of the past. And he knew what making sense is a famine. That makes sense. Let me go down to Egypt. And so in verse uh, Genesis, verse 26, Genesis chapter 26, verse three, the Bible says that sojourned in the land and I will. God is telling Isaac here, he says, Stay here in this land, sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee. Oh, there's a covenant. God says, I will be with thee. There's a covenant there now. God said, look, if you trust me, I'm going to bless you. I will be with you. My, my presence will be with you, Isaac. Again, we don't have any other record of God talking to Isaac, but here God talks directly to him. He says, I will be with thee, and I will bless thee, and for unto thee, and unto thy seed. Similar to what he told his dad. Well, again, the covenant's flowing through Isaac. So God's given Isaac a particular personal covenant with him. And he says, I will give all these countries, and I will perform oath, which I swear. God said, I swear it to your father. There's times in our life that there's blessings that are flowing down from our fathers, from our parents, from our grandparents that pray. And God's saying, stay here, do this, make this decision. And it's not because you, it's because of your fathers. I made a promise, God is saying. I made a promise to Abraham. I'm going to take care of you, Isaac. So God here seals the covenant. God tells Isaac to stay in this land. This land is barren. The land is in famine. But God doesn't address, and, and notice in Scripture, verse 3, God doesn't talk anything about a famine. God doesn't say, okay, I'm going to get rid of famine. God says, stay in this land. See, that's the kind of trust that we got to have. God's not focused on the circumstances. God's much greater than the famine. God already knows what's going to happen. God already knows what he has in plan for you. God already knows what he laid up for you, the blessings that are in your life, the blessings that are in your seed. God already has these promises that he promised your father and your mother. But now we see that God's not focused on no famine. He's not even talking about no famine. He's not even addressing the famine. He just says, stay here, sojourn in this land, and I will be with you. God is telling Isaac simply, not only are you going to have my presence, not only are you going to have my blessings, but I'm going to provide every way. No matter what the circumstances look like, God is trying to tell us, don't worry about the circumstances. Whatever I promised you before, I'm going to make it happen if you just stay put. God is telling somebody right now to just don't make that rash decision based off of circumstances right now. Don't make what looks like the best decision from a logical sense. Just trust me, lean on me, and I will make your life much better. I will give you that joy, God is saying. God is saying, don't worry about your situation. And then in verse 4, it says, And I will make thee seed to multiply as the stars in heaven. It sounds familiar, right? It sounds like what he told Abraham, the promises. And he says, as the stars in heaven, I will give unto thy seed all these countries, and thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The continuity of the covenant has to come through you, Isaac. The promise has to come through you. Don't go down to Egypt. Stay here. I will bless you. This is the land that I told you and told your fathers about. I will bless you. So God continues to establish this covenant through Isaac, what he had promised Abraham. And he says in verse 5, why? Why would God do this? Not only before you, but it's for your father. He says, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments and my statutes and my laws. I'm doing this, Isaac, for your father. And so we see in our lives, a lot of times decisions that we make affects the promises that are on our lives. There's many promises that God has laid down from our forefathers, from our fathers, and even through us to our own seeds. And so we have to make sure that we make these, when we make these decisions, that we're not just looking at the grass on the other side because the grass always looks greener 
Egypt was prospering at this time. Egypt was the place to be. Probably like New York is today. Egypt was the place. Isaac had a lot of money. Isaac had all the blessings of his father. He could probably do anything he wanted. He could probably stand up his own army. Isaac had many things. The king probably was sad to see Isaac go. He probably said, well, why? You know, hey, you, you, you provide a lot. But we see in verse 6, we notice something. That Isaac makes a decision. Isaac dwells in Gerar. He stays. He does what God wants him to do. But then, just like his father, he does something else. You see, Isaac... He did. He just took a step of good faith. He just established himself in obedience. But now the insecurity of something else comes upon him. You might have took this right decision. You might have made the right decision for God to God to say, look, I'm going to make this decision. And God blessed you. But there's something else in you that you got to deal with. Verse seven, it says, and a man in a place asked him being Isaac about his wife, Rebecca. She was beautiful. Here they go again. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Similar to what his father did twice. But when you think that he will have a different response, he knows the past. He knows that, wait a minute, my, 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 my mom was Sarah and she was beautiful and I, all the stories that I had heard about my father and he told a lie to the Philistines or to Abimelech? What does he do? What does Isaac do here? Isaac says the same thing. She is my sister. Why? For he feared to say she was my wife. How can you trust God in something so big and then make a big boo-boo with something so small? Why would you do that, Isaac? God just told you, stay here. My presence is with you. The blessings, the covenant, I'm going to make your seed is great. And now you fear for your own life over a person that's looking at your wife. Doesn't make sense. But life at times doesn't make sense. We can make the greatest decision in our obedience to God, but then we fear the smallest things, not remembering the covenant that God had on our life just a minute ago. If he would have stood on the covenant, he knows that he wouldn't be getting killed because God had already promised to see. And in fact, if God says my presence is with you, that's refuge. That's protection. All of those things come. But at the moment of that time, he tells a lie. He says, she, she is my wife. Lest he said to him, the men place should kill me for Rebecca because she's too fair upon. In other words, he said, unless I be dead, she's my wife, unless I be dead. Well, Basically, kind of like the color purple, the men asked, hey, Harpo, who is she? Who she is? Hey, Y'all remember that story? Hey, who she is? So when fear of men, the men of Greer, came upon Isaac, he sinned. He lied. He sinned. Because of his fable faith, his weak faith, Isaac put his wife and the promise in harm's way. Because think about it. Just that one lie. God had already stopped you from going down to Egypt. God had already stopped you from making that decision. Why would you have to lie? You don't. You just need to continue to trust God through all parts of the circumstances. But it's simply just like his father, Abraham, who did it twice. Isaac lied about his wife to protect his own butt. He was, he was a fearful that the men would kill him just like Abraham. It's, it's crazy, right? He's walking in the same footsteps as his father, but you would think he would learn some things. He learned about Egypt and the famine, but when he had learned about God's protective power because God didn't let the men kill his father, no, he lied. And again, so let's move down. Verse 8, he says, And it came to pass when he had been in there for a long time, he's just hanging out. Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, looked out his window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting, playing, loving, like a couple should do, right, with Rebekah, his wife. King had wisdom. 
though he was a pagan king, he had wisdom. And so Abimelech called Isaac and said, hey, hey, behold, that's your wife. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. And he says, you told us that was your sister. You lied. Now, you're supposed to be a man of God under the covenants of God. You talk about this God. He's protected. He's blessed you. But why would you lie to the king? And I just said, well, I, I didn't really lie. I just said, lest I die for her. Well, you lied. You, just, you, you deceived, deception. Call it what you want. And so verse 10 says, and Amalek said, what is it that thou hast done unto us? Look, man, if we, one of these men would lay with your wife, you would have brought all of that on us, similar to Abraham. And then in verse 11, it says, and Amalek charged all his people. God had, had, had touched the heart of the king to not kill him. <laughs> it's a mercy, right? But, you know, to say they don't touch her. Why? Because one thing about people, they know if you serve God and the covenant is on your life, they're not going to touch. They fear the God that you serve. And so he put a decree out there, don't touch his wife. She might look good, don't touch his wife. And so now I wanted to get down to verse 12. Just kind of wanted to go through there because this is where I wanted to talk about. The same year that the famine was in the land, that God's voice came to Isaac and said, don't go down to e Egypt. Don't make that decision. Though it looks like the right decision, Isaac, don't make that decision. Though it looks like the right decision because of your father's made that same decision and I blessed him, don't go down to Egypt. Hearken unto my voice and I will bless you. Because of his obedience in that sense, now God, of course, had mercy on him because he lied. You know, the king had mercy on him and that. But because of his obedience to God in that sense, God promised. Remember, God's promise wasn't directly to Isaac. Isaac's part of the covenant. He made a covenant with Isaac. But his covenant with Isaac was because of his promise and covenant to Abraham. So in verse 12, it says, Isaac sold in the land. Now, think about this. There's a famine in the land. I'm going to move out. I'm going down to Egypt. But Isaac sold in the land and received in the same year. I wish somebody get this. In the same year. We might be going through a famine. You might be going through a famine right now. You might be going through a dry season in your marriage, dry season in your job, dry season in your finances, dry season all together. I mean, just, just a famine in life. You might not even have a job. But if you trust and believe God and hold to his promises, he will bless you. Here we see that Abraham received in the same year a hundred Fold. That means that everything he planted, every seed, every seed brought an increase, brought a harvest, brought something a hundredfold in the same year of the famine because he trusted God. The only time that we see Isaac spoke, well, God spoke to Isaac. The only time that we see that Isaac was making the wrong decision and God says, trust me. Yeah, he made some other mistakes. He's not perfect. But God said, trust me and I will bless thee. We see in the same year, 2020, same year. Though it looks so bad right now, God is doing something great. God is blessing some people right now a hundredfold. Stop looking at the situation. Just align yourself up with God and ask God, what should I do? Where should I go? If God tells you don't go down to Egypt, don't do it. If God tells you don't have that extra marital affair, don't do it. If God tells you don't do it, there's a cost to it in disobedience. There's a cost to disobedience to God. But there's also a blessing in obedience, and it's an overwhelming blessing. 
Again, we see that Isaac sold in the land and received in the same year a hundredfold. And not only did he receive a hundredfold, but the Lord blessed him. Because of Isaac's obedience, and I'm, I'm, I'm closing, because of Isaac's obedience, the Bible says that he was blessed. We have to stay the course of what God wants for us. And if God changes our step, we got to make sure we change that step, not allow pride or any other things get in our way or doubt, because doubt in God's voice can be disturbing as well. It can it can be almost an, it could be an act of a, a disobedience. But here we see that God only spoke to Isaac once that we know of. And when he heard from the Lord, he acted upon what God told him because it was a covenant that God made. And so if God made a covenant with you, again, 2020 is not over. We only in May. We only look at the circumstance. We can look at this, this thing as a famine. We can look at it as why, why me? Why the land? Remember, God promised you things, but it doesn't mean it's perfect. God didn't make, promise you a perfect blessing. You might have to work. You might have to do some more trust. You might have to say, let me let you do your thing, Lord, but where do you want me to lay? Do you want me to take that job? It looks so good. They're offering me uh, 30% of what I make right now. I could buy a house half the price there. I could do a lot of things with extra money. I tell you, money is not everything. Money should not be the overall decision to making a life-changing event. You should be looking at a lot of other things, but most of all, you should be hearing from God. What do you have, Lord? Remember, if we say that we are his, if we say that we died in Christ, we are no longer our own. So now God directs our path every step. And we got to have the faith and trust in him because that's what he wanted out of Isaac. He allowed Isaac to make all the decisions, all the plans, even talk to the pagan king. And he waited as Isaac was going down the road, going towards Egypt. God waited and said, stop. What are you doing? Stay, sojourn in this land, and I will bless you, and I will be with you. I'm setting this covenant. God is saying that to somebody's heart even right now as we're talking online. The anointing of God is, is flowing, and, and God is giving this right time word for somebody out there that he said he'll bless you, that if you continue to do Whatever you sow, it will come back. I'm not saying a hundredfold, but it's going to come back and increase because of your obedience and the promise that he has in your life. If you didn't get anything else out tonight, one thing you got to understand is to acknowledge God in all your ways, and he will direct your path. To listen. Don't get too excited about things that look and appear like God. Because one thing we know about our enemy Satan. He can make things look so good. He can make things look like it's from God, like it's a blessing from God. He can convince even our parents and everybody else. But one thing you have to understand is you got to really hear from God to make that move. You really got to wait sometimes. And God wants you to trust. Sometimes it doesn't even make sense. It, it, it might be the craziest thing. But God's saying, no, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Yeah, it might look crazy to the normal person and not to take a job that's 30000 more, 40000 more, and, and you get a lake house and, and you get all the perks. People will talk about you saying, what is wrong with you? But one thing for sure. If God's not in it, don't make that decision. Because you never know. Many people took and, and had job opportunities and, and took the job, and about six months later, they were unemployed because the company went out of business. Or things on that job looked look really presentable, but then when they got there, they found out why that, that last CEO or CFO or administrator left because of the stress of working in that environment. Don't be that person. Make sure you hear from God in every decision. Don't 
go down and make a rash decision and break your covenant because the land is a famine. Stay with the promises that God laid on you. God can renew and, and revitalize anything in your life. Everything. If you just trust him and wait upon him, he will do it. If you're not saved, let us pray. Please, I beg of you to, to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. He died on the cross. He was buried and rose again. Accept him in your heart. Confess him out of your mouth. Believe what you say. Totally allow God to rework you from the inside out. Don't worry about what you're doing now, what habits you got. Don't worry about any of that stuff. Just trust him. If you're online and, and you, you're about to make a, a decision in your life that's going to affect your whole family, pray about it. Fast and pray. Seek God. Matter of fact, we're going to pray right now. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. Don't go down to Egypt, Lord. Father, we ask, Lord, that as we open our hearts to you, Lord, as we make decisions in our life, that every step that we make, Lord, that you direct our path. Lord, that you direct our path unto your purpose and your will, Lord, not our own, Lord. Though we might look with our own eyes and see things that look really good, that opportunities out there are great. Many blessings and many perks, Father God. We want to take a step back, and we want to allow you, Lord, to direct our path. And if you say no, we won't go, Father God. For we know that the obedience unto your word is much greater, and the blessings, just like the blessings that were on Isaac's life, though it was a famine in the land, though he had already made the decision to go to Egypt, you changed, and he decided to be obedient unto your word. And you blessed them, Lord, a hundredfold. And even, even more at times in the chapter, it says every, every well that he, he started was, was overpouring in his life. And Father God, he trusted you, Lord. We trust you, Father. We trust you in all our heart, Lord. We lean not to our own understanding, but we acknowledge you. And we ask, Father God, that you direct our path in every way, Father God. We give you the honor, the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, God bless you and, and continue to have a great Memorial Weekend. And please uh, take some time on Sunday to watch our Sunday school at 09 and then our uh, 10 o'clock worship service. We have a special guest. I'm not going to say his name, but we have a special guest on Sunday. God bless him. We have our powerful minister. I'm going to say his name. Is that all right? No, don't say his name. Uh, just come and see us. Just watch at 10 o'clock. I pray that the word blessed you and God bless you and good evening. Good night. Bye-bye.